So, if I saw a photo of this person, I could pretty much point her out. Uh, I don't remember her exact first and last name, but I do remember enough of what she looked like to be able to point out at least someone that looks similar to her. So, after that I was, I was really upset, obviously. That, that was one strange thing that happened. The other thing that happened later is that an entire huge collection of all of my medical records that I had compiled and put together for my personal records disappeared, and I believe that Krista Schneider is the person who took them. Because there was no one else around to take them. Um, it was either her or that when I was um, parked outside of this lawyer firm, who, and it was a lawyer who was working for me, but he was also working for the Archdiocese of Portland and Oregon. And, but there was no car entry, there was no break-in or anything. I just remembered that it was when I was at his firm, <clears throat> or parked on the street, there by his place, that's when I noticed my records were gone. All of my medical files were gone. But the last time that I had remembered they were there is when Krista was there at my house. And they disappeared on that day, and I remember I took a photo of her. It was the first time I'd ever take a photo, and she said no, and she didn't want me to take a photo of her. She had been acting as my friend for over two and a half years by that time, taking me out all the time, basically trying to distract me from my lawsuits all the time, and getting introducing me to alcohol and then wanting to inter have me take up smoking, which I didn't do, but building my confidence that she was someone safe and that I could trust, and then after she built my confidence, ditching me so that I was left out in the open for different various men to prey on me. So this was very uh, shocking, and I was going to take a photo of her because at that time I didn't realize the extent of everything she was doing and what she was up to and who she knew. So I was taking a photo and, and she's, she was so insistent she didn't want even one, me, she did not want me to have even one photo. And at that time in my life, I wasn't putting photos up of people, I didn't have a blog, I didn't do anything like that, but she didn't want me to have any kind of photo documentation of who she was and that she was around me. And I remember that when I was taking this photo, it was, pro it was about the time, I think it was the day that um, my medical records all disappeared. So maybe, you know, she felt like it was mug, a mug shot of some kind. <laughs> um, and then things got really interesting with her dad later because then they offered me a job down the road. Basically, I was getting screwed out of stuff. Um, I was being blackmailed. She said, well, why don't you work here for a week? So I worked for her dad for a week, and then they accused me of stealing from the till. So it was basically, it was like an offer to work for them to just then turn around and accuse me of, of doing something that I didn't do. And they knew I didn't do it because they had their cameras there, and they knew when I was there, and I was there with a the supervisor. So it was me and this other person, and I didn't steal a thing. And they could have verified that, you know, by looking at their cameras. So, basically, This is the kind of thing that was happening. I had um, a lot of things going on at that time. I can get more into when my medical records disappeared or like what was going on surrounding that situation when they did disappear. But it was actually... It was... Uh, probably in about 2002 that it, that that happened, or two, 2002, maybe a little bit after 2002, maybe like 2000, more like 2003 or so, 2002, because I think it was probably 2002 because I didn't go back to that lawyer's place, and he he ditched me two weeks before my statutes were about to expire, and then I had to file everything on my own. So I, I think I did try to go back to his offices to get my record, to get my to pick up my file from him because he wasn't releasing it. So I went to the PLF about that. And so actually that might have been 2003. I had to see when I went to the PLF and complained about not having my, my file returned to me. 
but after this thing happened, you know, so it was um, Tanzer and then the FBI guys and then Dylan, and Dylan was always showing up whenever I was out with Jonathan, who was that Jewish person that I ended up with after Chris didn't show up one night where she was going to meet me at a club. And after I burst into tears over what Dylan tried, you know, and this had happened, was happening over and over, I then, you know, I told Julia Thornton I was leaving the state. And that I mean that I was going to be commuting to college and living in Kashmir with my grandmother. So she didn't really want me to do that, I could tell. And I went ahead and made the move. And once I was there, I took well, I had all of my boxes, my legal records, and I left them over there. And then I continued with my lawsuits, I continued with college, and then I was staying with, you know, guests, staying as a guest here and there while I was um, doing all that. And then that is, of course, when the FBI SSAs from Washington, D.C. and from California came to see me. And as I said, the one guy was Mormon, the other guy was Catholic. I think that the Mormon person had business, had a, some kind of a business tie to, or connection to Robin Bechtold because Re Bechtold also was working for um, the Wiltbanks who were Mormon and they're also connected to the Middletons. And so the Bechtolds and the Wiltbanks were in business together and then I guess Harris was also in business with them, which I didn't realize, but at some point he was. And so this this Mormon man who came out to take my report, I don't know if he had a conflict of interest or not. And the only other Mormons that I can think of that might have had, most of the Mormons I've known have been really nice, but the only one that I can think of that might have had another conflict is possibly, I don't know if Arthur K. Smith is Mormon, but the president for that University of Utah College because they had allowed people to implant me with microchips at that college and those people got a lot of money from it. And Arthur K. Smith also indicated by some of his comments when he later went to Texas as president, um, he, it sounded to me like he was kind of making some quips relating to the Bechtolds and things that I used to talk to the Bechtold family about. And like I said, Janet Bechtold seemed to know a lot of, about what was going on. And she was friends with Erica Wiltbank and people, other people who were connected to the Middletons. She was also connected to California and to June Smith, who married Arthur K. Smith. And a lot of Janet Bechtold's California connections um, started showing up when I did some research. research began to show up as connections that went to Utah and uh, a lot of different other places. And the people that I, I was finding out were acting kind of strange toward me. And so, I think that there, on that level, there was nothing, there was no religious problem. I didn't have, I mean, I personally didn't have a problem with anybody who was Mormon. I think that it came down possibly to money and what someone's incentives and motives were then with, I guess, Middletons and UK connections in addition to United States connections. So the Mormon person from Washington, D.C., he was also military. So that would indicate that he was helping cover up the MK Ultra program that was still, at least if it was latent. Um, actually, no, it wasn't latent because you know once you implant somebody with microchips, 1995, it's not latent because they were targeting targeting me with with um, migraines. So he was military and he was FBI. My this implantation occurred 
under director Louis Free, who was connected to people that I'd been working that I worked for in New Jersey, in Bedminster, New Jersey, as a nanny. So I worked for Lisa and Brian Tabo in Bedminster, New Jersey. They had three kids then, and they ended up having four eventually. And I think I'm pretty sure that the FBI director, Louis Free, who was also from New Jersey, knew them, and I don't know if I had offended them and insulted them, so they were also part of allowing this to happen to me, but I did find out that the Tabos have relatives in Texas, in the same area where this university was, and they also have a relative by the last name of Bailey, and one of the adversarial law firms that I was dealing with in Portland, Oregon, when I had to go to court, was Bullivant Hauser Bailey. And that is one thing I haven't checked on yet, to find out whether the Baileys, it's just a coincidence in name or not, because before I ever had the problem with the Abbey, I had my jacket stolen from a parking garage right across from those offices, and I couldn't figure out why anybody would have anything against me in 1994, you know, be targeting me, and I had just come back from the East Coast. So... However, once again, I didn't have, I wasn't assaulted with military technology when I was on the East Coast. Um, most of that was occurring in Oregon and over here. Um, later, much later, it did occur on the East Coast when I was in the Washington, D.C. slash Arlington, Maryland, Virginia area. And then it was also occurring when I was in Tennessee. They basically just started doing it wherever. But initially for a very long time. It was mainly like the Northwest. So that th that's what I know about the this Mormon SSA. The California one had some contacts or connections. He had gone to the same school as Brother Ansgar Santa Grossi and he'd gone to the Catholic University of America in Washington DC about the same time that that Brother Ansgar went. And I really felt that he was motivated to make me look bad, possibly, as well, um, for the my legal adversaries that I was dealing with. After they came out to take my report, I was in my commute to Washington State I was pulled over a couple of times by police, and there were police on every corner. And the route that I was taking was from Portland, and then, of course, on the, on the freeway across the state lines, and then I had to go through a pass, and into, then down, dropping down to Dryden, and then into Wenatchee, and then Kashmir. It was about a three-hour drive or less, uh, probably three hours. And one time I was speeding, the guy that stopped me was had been in a helicopter above me and stopped, and made, but he made a really big deal about it. They were almost treating me like I was as an escaping refugee, or escaped, escaping convict or something. I mean, because why would it be such a big deal for him to be in a helicopter and then to chase after me and I noticed that he had this one pin on his lapel and I said what I said that's a sharpshooter pin 